Hi, good evening. I am Yolanda Bhavan. Axic.com online personal for uh, teaching zoology the resource course. So last class we started another type of tissue. Just what we have the muscle tissue. I mentioned about the general characteristics. A few words about that one. Normally the muscles can contract, can relax, but never expand. And they are all biological machines have the ability of converting the chemical energy into mechanical work. Some reactions are going on inside the muscle, some chemical reactions. As a result, the chemical energy gets converted into mechanical energy so that we can do the work. That's why I say it is acting as a biological machine. Now let's see something about the various types of muscle tissues. We can have a broad classification based on the location of the muscles, whether they are present in the visceral organs or in the heart or attached to the bones or based on their appearance, whether they have any striations or stripes on their surface and also based on the nature of regulation, whether they are under our control or working independently or involuntarily. So accordingly, we have three different groups of muscles what are given here in the form of flow chart. Number one, the skeletal or stripe or voluntary muscles. They have stripes, that is why they are called striped muscles. They are attached to the bones, hence called the skeletal muscles. They are working under our control, hence called voluntary muscles. The second one, just I already mentioned about this one in the last class, itself, visceral muscles. They are found in the visceral organs as they have no striations. They are simply called as a smooth muscles. Then the third type, the cardiac muscle, as it is found in the heart, they also show some kind of striations, feeble striations, hence called strike. And both the visceral muscles and cardiac muscles are working independently, not under the control of our will, hence called as involuntary muscles. This is the general classification. Now let's get into the different types of tissues and their characteristics, what the functions they perform. So number one, the skeletal muscle tissue. See, any muscle tissue is formed of any type. You can see any type of muscle tissue is formed of bundles of muscle cells. The muscle cells are named differently. Either it is a smooth muscle or skeletal muscle or the heart muscle. In all cases, they are all being formed of bundles of muscle cells. The muscle cells are also called as muscle fibers because they are all elongated like a fiber. Hence the name muscle fibers. Also called myocytes, the muscle cells, or sarcocytes in Greek, what we are taking sarco means flesh, hence the name sarcocytes. So muscle fibers or muscle cells or myocytes or sarcocytes are all same. Then, let's take the entire muscle. So normally the skeletal muscles are formed attached to the bones. And the entire skeletal muscle is having a covering, it is ensheathed by means of a fibrous connective tissue, particularly more or less a dense fibrous connective tissue. So the whole muscle is ensheathed or covered or enveloped by a fibrous connective tissue, what we call this one epimysium. I will show you the picture later. So normally each muscle is formed of many muscle fibers. The muscle fibers are always formed in bundles. So, each muscle bundle is called fasciculus. Each muscle bundle is called fasciculus. So, a muscle is formed of many muscle bundles. So, called the fasciculi. A number of muscle bundles make one muscle. A number of muscle fibers make one fascicle. One fascicle. Now, the entire muscle is ensheathed or covered by a fibrous connective tissue, epimasium. Similarly, the entire muscle bundle, actually what is called the fasciculus, again covered and enclosed or ensheathed by another connective tissue that is fibrous connective tissue called as perimysium. So all the sheets are on the fasciculum. So we have many fasciculi. Each fasciculus is surrounded by normally a membrane is covering a fibrous connective tissue, what is called perimysium. So each fasciculus is made up of many muscle fibers and each muscle individual fiber, each individual muscle fiber or each, individual, each muscle actually having the individual muscle fibers. 
So the individual muscle fibers are again sheathed by another covering, what is called endomysium. So we have three coverings from inner to outer. Each muscle fiber is surrounded or each muscle cell is surrounded by or actually unsheathed by a fibrous connective tissue, what is called endomysium. Each bundle or fasciculus is surrounded by a membranous covering or what we call this one fibrous connective tissue, the perimysium. The entire muscle is normally surrounded by another covering, a fibrous connective tissue, what we call this one epimysium. So epi, peri and endomysium. So all these membranous coverings and sheathing, actually and sheathing the muscle. So they are actually extending beyond the level of the muscle and forms a structure, what we call this one is a tendon, the one which connects the muscles with the bones. So all the fibrous connective tissues beyond the muscle extend to form what is called a tendon. So the extension of all these fibrous sheets beyond this lens of the muscle together constitute the tendon. I mentioned about this tendon and ligaments. Ligaments both are nothing but the regular dense fibrous connective tissue. Tendon is an example for regular just fibrous connective tissue. That is nothing but a dense fibrous connective tissue. A tendon connects a muscle with the muscle. A tendon connects a muscle, sorry. A tendon connects a muscle with the bone. A ligament normally connects a bone with another bone. That is the main difference between these two. There is also another structure, what we call this one, fascia or fascia. This is another structure which connects a muscle with another muscle. So muscle with bone, like tendons, a bone with bone, the ligaments. A muscle with muscle is also connected by another just structure, what is called fascia. So fascia connecting one muscle with another muscle. That's a peculiar structure. So anyway, the tendons are nothing but the extension of the fibrous connective tissue, coverings of the entire muscle. So normally, those muscles attached to the bones are called the skeletal muscles or striped muscles or voluntary muscles. And what about the tongue? The tongue is also an example for striped muscle or voluntary muscle or a skeletal muscle. Though it is called as a skeletal muscle, it is never attached to a bone. It is simply you know that one connected to the base of the buccal cavity. And such a muscle found in the tongue, which is not attached to the bone, but formed freely is called as intrinsic muscle. The skeletal muscle of the tongue is called intrinsic muscle because it is not attached to the bone, but it is called as a skeletal muscle as it has the property similar to those of other skeletal muscles. But such muscles which are not connected to the bones are called intrinsic muscles. Now, what about the muscles, sir? About the skeletal muscles, sir? If you take any muscle cell, it is normally elongated and cylindrical in shape like this. Elongated and cylindrical. And each one has an outer membrane, what is called sarcolemma. So this is nothing but a modified muscle cell, muscle actually modified cell only, a specialized cell, but having no power of regeneration, having no power of division. But possessing certain characters, relaxing, contracting, but never expanding. Now here, the normal cell membrane, in the case of a normal cell, is called as sarcolemma. The word sarco refers to flesh in Greek, sarcolemma. The cytoplasm of the muscle cell is called sarcoplasm. The mitochondria is called as sarcosome. The endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle fiber is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. So sarcolemma, sarcoplasm, sarcoplasmic reticulum, then sarcosome, nothing but actually the mitochondria. Now, each individual muscle fiber is an elongated cell, cylindrical in shape, somewhat elongated but never branched, having an outer membrane, what we call this one sarcolemma. This is sarcolemma, outer membrane. Nothing but a plasma, lemma, plasma membrane, a normal cell membrane. Then, so normally I mentioned earlier, now this is a cytoplasm, what is called a sarcoplasm. The cytoplasm is otherwise called as a sarcoplasm. Sarcoplasm. So each individual muscle cell is nothing but an elongated fiber, having an outer membrane, as in the case of normal cell, called sarcolemma. Containing a cytoplasm, what we call this one, the sarcoplasm. 
Now, in each muscle cell or fiber, we have many nuclei. So it is a multinucleate cell. It is a multinucleate cell. The nuclei are formed towards the peripheral cytoplasm or towards the periphery or towards the what is called a circle lemma. So a multinucleate. So this is a nucleus. Multinucleate condition having many nuclei. The nuclei are formed towards the periphery or towards the circle lemma. Now in the sarcopla, suppose you are taking the length of the muscle fiber. Each muscle fiber is ranging a length from 1 to 20 millimeter. The muscle fiber is ranging a length from 1 to 20 millimeter. Now in the sarcoplasm are present fine delicate thread like structures. Like this, they are running parallel to the entire length like this. In the sarcoplasm we have fine delicate. The number varies from just actually 4 to 20. Fine delicate thread like structures are formed in the sarcoplasm. And these filaments are called the myofibril. These filaments are called myofibrils. And their length is more or less equal to the length of the total muscle fiber. But the thickness of the diameter is about only 1 to 3 microns. The diameter is about 1 to 3 microns. The length is varying from one muscle cell to another muscle cell. It is varying from 1 to 20 millimeter. Then, actually, these myofibers exhibit dark and light bands. They exhibit dark and light bands because of the presence of certain filaments in them. And as a result, the muscle fiber is striped in appearance. The muscle fiber is striped in appearance like this. This is because of the dark and light regions exhibited by, that is the muscle filaments, what we call this one, the myofibers. The myofibers in their turn are made up of some filament structures, some thick filaments and thick filaments. The thick and thin filaments of the myofibers are responsible for the dark and light bands which give striped or striated appearance to the muscle fiber, hence the name striped muscle or striated muscle. So anyway, if you are taking one muscle fiber on a cell, elongated, cylindrical, having an outer membrane called sarcolemma, a cytoplasm called sarcoplasm, <coughs> in the sarcoplasm on form, we have run parallel to each other a number of fine fibers dedicated in nature called as myofibers. And these myofibers in their turn are made up of some filaments, some thick and thin filaments. The thick filaments are made up of one type of protein when studying higher classes, for example, myosin filament, myosin protein. The thin filaments are made up of actic protein. And because of the presence of these thick and thin filaments of these myofibrils, you have some striped appearance on the surface of the muscle fiber, and hence called the striated muscle or striped muscle. This is because of the alternate dark and light bands. This is the simplest organization when studying more in higher classes. Now, I mentioned earlier the organelles found in the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber are named as sarcosomes or sarcoplasm reticulum, etc. Now, in the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm, we have the endoplasmic reticulum called as sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, it is the nature of the muscle fiber, sarcoplasm reticulum, sarcolemma is present, myofibril is present, dark and light bands are present. These are some of the specific characteristics of this muscle fiber. So, now let me compare later with the other types of muscle fibers. We will see it. Then, in the case of skeletal muscles, we have a peculiar type of hemoglobin. So, you know that one, we have the blood red in color already studied under the fluid connected tissue. In the RBCs, we have a type of pigment, what we call this one, the hemoglobin, a type of conjugated protein. Helps in the transport of oxygen from the lungs to the tissues through the blood. Now, in the muscle tissues, and normally, the skeletal muscle tissues, the skeletal muscle tissues contain a kind of hemoglobin. Though we are using the word a kind of hemoglobin, it is not a hemoglobin, no way connected in structure with hemoglobin. But I am using the word a type of hemoglobin, it is not a hemoglobin. So what is called a myoglobin, a type of hemoglobin, it is nothing but a type of protein found in the skeletal muscle fibers. As it is found in the muscle, it is called myoglobin. It gives more red color to the red muscle. 
and less in number are absent in the case of white muscle fiber. Red muscle fiber, white muscle fiber. Are the white muscles, red muscles are the two different types of skeletal muscles we can see. So anyway, what is myoglobin? A type of pigment. A protein is a structure found in the muscle, only in the skeletal muscles, concerned with the transport of oxygen. Though it is called as a type of hemoglobin, it is no way connected to the structure of a structure of hemoglobin. No way connected to the structure of hemoglobin. So that is the thing what we have. So myoglobin is nothing but a kind of pigment found in the muscle, particularly in the skeletal muscle, concerned with the transport of oxygen. If you are comparing the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin, the red pigment and myoglobin, the myoglobin is normally having more affinity towards oxygen than hemoglobin. It can carry more amount of oxygen. It shows more affinity towards oxygen than hemoglobin. So it is most abundant also in the flight muscles of birds because the muscles of birds need more energy for flight. Now here is a structure, a simple structure, there is nothing but our original structure which is being made as a slide. Now each one is a muscle fiber, each one, the long columns represent the skeletal muscle fiber or skeletal muscle fiber. Now the outer covering you see that one sarcolemma. lemma. Then towards the periphery you have the nucleus, the nucleus is present towards the periphery and you can see the striations, dark, light, dark, light bands which give stripe appearance, hence the name striated muscle. Sarcolemma is most distinct in the case of striated muscle fiber when compared to other muscle fiber. So we are using the word often this fiber that is nothing but a cell which is elongated. That is why the name is given striated muscle fiber. Now just I want to show the epimysium, perimysium and the endomysium. I want to show two diagrams. Now this is the entire muscle. The whole structure is the entire muscle. And each muscle is formed of many muscle bundles. This is one muscle bundle, what is called fascicle or fasciculus. So, many bundles, one, two, just three, four, five bundles here in the diagram represented. So, we have many bundles of muscle fibers. And each muscle bundle consists of individual muscle fibers. See, these are all the individual muscle fibers enclosed within a fascicle. So, a muscle which is made up of many fascicles and each fascicle is formed of many muscle fibers. And if you are taking each muscle fiber within which you can have many myofibers, that is a unit. Then, see that one, one muscle fiber is pulled out, so here I represented just five muscle, five muscle fibers which have been pulled. And then the soft lemon, the outer covering, the blood capillary, etc. Now we see that one, the entire muscle is covered by means of a membrane is covering epimysium. Now one bundle is covered by means of perimysium and one muscle fiber is enclosed by means of endomysium. I will show another picture just to show the clear representation of this one. See that one, this is the entire muscle. We have this is epimysium, that's why it can represent here, this is the epimysium, the outermost one epimysium. You see that one this muscle bundle, this is one muscle bundle and this one is a perimysium and we have the, the individual muscle fibers. The individual muscle fibers are surrounded by a covering what we call this one the endomysium. So endomysium covering individual muscle fiber, then perimysium covering just actually a muscle bundle having many muscle fibers and then epimysium the whole Muscle is being ensheathed or enveloped by a dense fibrous connective tissue, what is called epimysis. Now, all these membranous coverings are just actually extending beyond the muscle to form the tendon. It is the one which connecting the muscle to the bone. This is the clear picture showing the perimysium, epimysium, the muscle bundles, endomysium, and also the tendon. Uh, just nothing but a fibrous connective tissue in elastic nature connecting the muscle with the bones. Now, under the skeletal muscle, we have two different types of skeletal muscle fibers. Just like the fat, what I see in the brown fat, and then just the white fat and yellow fat. Brown fat and yellow fat. Or white fat. Now, there are two types of skeletal muscles. One is called the red skeletal muscle or white skeletal muscle. The red skeletal muscles are always actually showing a sustained contraction, a slow contraction. 
That is why they are called a slow twitch fire. The contraction is very slow. The muscles are never actually the muscles are actually fainting or tiny slowly. So such muscle fibers are called slow twitch fiber because the rate or the speed of contraction is slow. In contrast to this one, we have a fast twitch muscle fiber. The muscle fibers are having the property of undergoing contraction very rapidly. Hence the name just actually fast twitch muscle. Now the slow twitch muscle fibers are again called red skeletal muscle. This is based on the abundance of myoglobin. And also here the white skeletal muscle because of the absence of myoglobin. Now let's come back. So this is based on the rapid contraction as well as the number or the presence or absence of myoglobin, a pigment responsible for the transport of oxygen. Now number one. As the name implies, the rich skeletal muscle, they contain abundance of myoglobin. That's why they are normally red in color. And also, actually, with more mitochondria to provide energy. The myoglobin is meant for just actually transporting oxygen to the tissues. And the mitochondria, more in number in these muscles because to oxidize the food to release energy for actually the muscles to undergo contraction. Then in the case of white skeletal muscle, they are white in color because of the absence of the big metal board, we call this one the myoglobin, that is absent. And the number of mitochondria is also less. Then, these muscles, the red skeletal muscles, they undergo just normally a sustained slow contraction. Sustained slow contraction. For a long period, that is why they are getting fatigued slowly. The rate of contraction is slow. They show sustained contraction for a longer period. That is why they are getting fatigued very slowly. In contrast to this one, if you are taking the white skeletal muscle, there you see that they are meant for fast, stolenous and physical activity. See, if you are taking a sparrow, if you are comparing with that of what is called the kite, the kite though it is normally just flying at high, the sparrow is normally strict to move up. It's flying within a short period and taking rest, then only it can move. But the kind is moving always, flying for a longer duration. So, in the case of this one white skeletal muscle, it's meant for fast and strenuous physical activity. As a result, they are just normally functioning only for a short duration as they are getting very tired, very fat. So, the first one is for slow and sustained contraction for a longer period and also attaining fat slowly. The second one is meant for fast and physical strenuous activity only for a short duration because they are getting fatty slow. Now what are the examples for the mention already? So the flight muscles are meant for actually the flight in the case of birds. Now the flight muscles are kinds, an example for its skeletal muscle and similarly our back muscles. So when you are working for a longer time, the back muscles are actually getting tired only very slowly. They undergo very slow sustained contraction, unlike the eye muscles. So the eye muscles we are taking in this human beings, they are actually working fast. That is why when you are looking at computer for a long period, you get tired, you cannot watch the TV for a longer time because the muscles get tired. Even while watching some games, we are getting tired. So the muscles of the eye and also the muscles of the sparrow, the swift to move up. In these two cases, we have the white skeletal muscle. You can imagine, you can just remember what I think so. The sparrow, the swift actually, it flies fastly from one place to another, only for a short distance. After taking rest only, it is just moving too. But where is the kite? Where is the pelican? Where is actually the migratory birds? They are moving for a longer distance. You know that one from Australia to Vanuangal or Australia to some other lakes with our name. So this is happening because they have such a muscle, the spread skeletal muscle, abundance of myoglobin. They are getting tired only very slowly, unlike the sparrow or just the eye muscles. But you have normally the muscles getting tired because of a short duration of their activity because of the fast activity, the physical activity, very sternous activity. So this is the comparison between the red skeletal muscle and white skeletal muscle, both of which are nothing but the skeletal muscles only. But the chemical composition and the working capacity different between these two. Now let's pass on to the next pair, the visceral muscle. The name implies 
visceral referring to the visceral organs and those organs found in the body cavity say an example the ureter the urinary bladder the muscles of the alimentary canal or we have simply we can say the alimentary canal or we can have the kidneys so the blood vessels all are formed in the cavity of the body called as together the visceral organs so as these muscles are formed only in the visceral organs they are considered as the visceral muscles for example the ureter the urinary bladder the wall of the alimentary canal the wall of the blood vessels in all cases we have such muscles and why are they called smooth muscles because they do not have any stripes they do not have any striations in their muscle they never show any dot and line bands hence calls a smooth muscle now if you are taking the individual muscle fibers so what is the nature of the individual muscle fibers <coughs> the individual muscle fibers are very long but spindle shaped fibers they are spindle shaped and in these muscles normally there are no striations there is a centrally located nucleus now this is the nucleus and about the sarcoid lemma the sarcoid lemma is not distinct it is indistinct so the individual muscle fibers are spindle shaped with a centrally located nucleus or less spindle shape and they do not exhibit any transverse bands or striations it is called as actually the smooth muscle that is the name Unlike the skeletal muscle, where you have the covering, the epimyceum, endomyceum, and the perimyceum, here such things are absent, not having any fibrous connective tissue. But you have a type of connective tissue covering the entire muscle fiber or the entire muscle that is named as the loose connective tissue. There you have the skeletal muscle that is normally unsheathed by fibrous connective tissue. Here it is called as a loose connective tissue. So we have bundle of smooth muscle fibers which are ensheathed by loose fibrous connective tissue, unlike the skeletal muscles. I mentioned already they are called visceral muscles because their location they are found in the visceral organs. Okay. Now, unlike the skeletal muscles, there they are found in bundles, the muscle fibers. But again, the muscle fibers are arranged in the form of sheets, layer by layer, or in the form of layers. They are actually placed actually parallel to each other. They are in the form of what we call this one, the muscle sheets or the muscle layers. They are never found in bundles. They are found in the form of sheets or layers. And unlike the skeletal muscle, you know that the skeletal muscle is working under our control, under our will. Hence called as a voluntary muscle. For example, the muscles of uh, the cough muscles, the arm muscles, the gastrocnemius muscles, the hamstring muscles, the cordyceps muscles, all muscles, the biceps and triceps are skeletal muscles including the tongue and they are all working under the control, so under the control of nervous system. When we are saying that one stop working, they will stop. Hence cause the voluntary muscles. But these muscles are smooth muscles, for example the stomach muscle, it never stops its movement, it is always working under its own because it is not under the control of central nervous system but under the control of another nervous system which is autonomous in nature what we call this one autonomous nervous system that is why these muscles are not working under control even if you are taking the heart muscle a separate type, a special type it is also working involuntarily not working under our control hence all these muscles are called the involuntary muscles so it is called involuntary muscle because it is not under the conscious control of the animal or of ourselves then and i mentioned already if you are comparing the speed of working the skeletal muscles are somewhat working faster and they are getting fatigued very soon they are getting fatigued just actually very soon but in the case of these muscles, they are actually undergoing contraction very slowly and getting fatigue very slowly. We are already compared the skeletal muscles to two types, red and white. Now we are comparing the skeletal muscles with that of the smooth muscles. The skeletal muscles generally actually undergo faster contraction and they are getting fatigue quickly. But in this case, unstriped muscles, non straight muscles or what we can say the smooth muscles, they undergo contraction very slowly and getting fat very slowly. Then, so normally after contraction, the next stage in the muscle fiber is nothing but the relaxation stage. 
But if you are taking just in the case of smooth muscles, even after contraction, they can remain in a state of partial contraction for a long period. Some sort of residual contraction is there. Some sort of residual contraction is there even after the muscle has contracted, completed the work. So, they can remain in a state of partial contraction over a long period. They can remain in a state of partial contraction or full contraction. After contraction, the muscles are extending. But somehow the residual degree of contraction remains in the muscle, in the case of smooth muscles. So that can remain for a longer period in the muscle. Now what if we splinters? So they are nothing but a special group of smooth muscles formed around the openings. For example, around the anal openings or around the openings between the esophagus and stomach. Now here there is the ring of muscle at the junction of the esophagus and stomach and also at the junction of uh, the stomach and the intestine. So, such muscles are called sphincter muscles. So, the sphincter muscles are nothing but a ring of smooth muscles present around actually certain openings. For example, the anus or around the openings. Say an example between uh, the esophagus and the stomach and this is what is called cardiac sphincter. Cardiac sphincter muscle. And also between the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, this is what is called the pyloric sphincter muscle. The main function of such sphincter muscles actually to regulate the passage of substances, the flow of substances from one organ to another organ or to the outside. For example, the ring of muscles found in the anal sphincter is responsible for the passage of the waste outside. And here the sphincter formed between the stomach and the pylo, between the stomach and the small intestine, what we call this one the pyloric sphincter. And this sphincter muscle regulates the flow of partially digested food from the stomach into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. So in any way they are concerned with actually the passage of substances from one organ to another organ or from the body to the outside. They are nothing but the smooth muscles one. Now, normally, all the muscles are actually mesodermal except in one muscle, what I mentioned, the muscle formed in the iris of the eye is an example for smooth muscle which is ectodermal in origin. Now, we will see the picture. The smooth muscle, you can see they are arranged in layers or sheets and each one is more or less spindle shape, having a large nucleus located in the center. The muscle cell is nothing but a spindle shaped one not arranged in bundles but arranged in the form of lays or sheets and then sheathed by a loose connective tissue having a nucleus in the center. So in these muscles normally the sarcal lemma is not distinct though we have an outer membrane like structure the sarcal lemma is not distinct. Sarcal lemma is distinct only in the case of skeletal muscles. Now let's pass on to the third type of muscle a special type of muscle found in the wall of the heart a special type of striped muscle that we involved in muscle working for a long period without getting fat, without getting time. So it is nothing but a special type of muscle present in the heart, actually striped in nature, involved in nature, made up of fibers formed in the wall of the heart. Unlike other fibers or other muscle cells, actually it is formed of many cells. It is nothing but a chain of cells like this. It is nothing but a chain of cells. The cells are joined end to end like this. It is formed of a chain of cells, not a single cell. The smooth muscle is a simple cell. Then you have, for example, if you are taking the smooth muscle fiber or if you are taking the skeletal muscle fiber, they are all simple cells. They never show any branching. But in the case of this one, it is formed of many cells. The cells are arranged end to end. That is why I mentioned here, each fiber is nothing but a chain of cells, joined end to end. And as in the case of striated muscle, they also exhibit the striations. You can see the striations, but the striations are not very distinct. Now, in addition to these feeble striations, now these are all the striations we have. These are all the striations, as in the case of skeletal muscle fiber. There are some irregular transverse dark bands of present, dark bands like this. These irregular actually the dark bands form in addition to the feeble striations are called intercalated disc. They are called intercalated disc. They are called intercalated disc. 
They form only the hot mass. Irregular, dense, or dark bands, just transverse bands formed in the cardiac muscle. They are called intercalated discs. So this is all formed in addition to the normal feeble striations formed in the heart muscle fiber. So what about the nature of the muscle fiber? You see that one the muscle fiber is more or less cylindrical but short in length when compared to the skeletal muscle. Then normally they are all branch and the veins are truncated. Truncated means bifurcated, truncated branch. So the muscle cells are normally cylindrical but shorter when compared to the skeletal muscle and the ends are truncated like this. This is the truncation so what I mentioned. Truncated. Then there is normally a single nucleus present in the center, not towards the periphery, as in the case of uh, that is a skeletal muscle fiber, the nucleus is formed in the center, not in the periphery. And I mentioned earlier the striations are not very distinct, they are feeble in nature. And from the muscle fiber, they send adjacent actually little branches. Little branches arise from the muscle fiber, individual muscle fiber. Such little branches join with the branches of the adjacent muscle fiber. So this is adjacent muscle fiber, this is the little branch of this one and that one join each with one another, forming a branched structure. And between these muscle fibers, we have a space. That space is filled with loose connective tissue. That space is filled with loose connective tissue. So, each muscle fiber shows little branches. The little branches are joining with the little branches of the adjacent muscle fiber. And between the muscle fibers, we have a space filled with loose connective tissue. And I mentioned here, they send little branches which join similar branches of the neighboring cells. So, these are all the branches of the neighboring cells which are joined with one another. I mentioned all of the narrow space. This is the narrow space. That narrow space is filled with the loose connective tissue. Okay? And between the cells, the adjacent cells, what I studied already, the cell junctions, gap junctions, tight junctions, junctions of adherence. These are all the different types of junctions we have between the cells. Tight junctions. Also, we have what is called the gap junctions. Then adherence junctions between the cells, adjacent cells. So anyway, we have their normally called as a cell junctions. They are commonly called as cell junctions. The cell junctions of the plasma membranes of the adjacent fibers fuse together. They help in the transport of materials across them. So cell junctions fuse the plasma membranes of cardiac muscle cells. That means the cardiac muscle cells, adjacent cell cells are fused with one another. That means the plasma membranes or the sarcoid lemma fuse with one another either by means of gap junctions or by means of tight junctions or by means of adherence junction. These are all the different types of junctions we will be studying in the 11th standard. So anyway, gap junctions are helpful in the transport of, for example, desmosome. You can hear this word also, desmosome, between the cells. The passage of substance is taking place between the cells because of the cell junctions only. So we have different types of cell junctions. You can have it later once again in the 11th standard. Now here is the structure. You see that one, the individual muscle fiber, they are all looking like a branch of structure. You see, this is the branch. And you can have the intercalated disc. So this is the one what represents the branches. These are all the branches connecting the adjacent muscle fibers. And you can have also, this is the intercalated disc. A darker band, a transverse band, just normally formed in addition to that is a feeble striation in the case of muscle. So just like the nervous tissue, normally the cardiac muscles are any muscles, generally speaking. But specifically speaking, the cardiac muscle fibers are incapable of undergoing mitosis. They never undergo division once formed. And also they do not possess the capacity of regeneration. And that is why we can have the myocardial infarction or some kind of heart attack, etc. This is because of the damage of the heart tissue. Once a part of the heart tissue being damaged, it cannot be regenerated once again. So the cardiac muscle fibers do not, generally the muscles are not having the power of regeneration, general power. But specifically speaking, in the case of cardiac muscle fibers, they are incapable of undergoing just what we call this one, mitosis, there is no cell division. And do not possess the capacity of regeneration, they cannot able to replace their last parts. This is because
because of the absence of two types of cells normally found the muscle cells responsible for regeneration. The cells are called pericytes and satellite cells. So the pericytes and satellite cells are simply called the regenerating cells responsible for wound healing, responsible for replacing the damaged tissues. They are found in the muscle cells, the pericytes and satellites, they are regenerating cells having the power of regeneration. But such cells are absent in the cardiac muscle fiber. They are generally present in other muscle fibers but absent in the case of cardiac muscle. So no mitosis, no capacity of regeneration in the case of cardiac muscle. So there is no increase in the number of cells in the heart. <coughs> Even a particular part of the heart muscle is damaged, it cannot be replaced. That is why we can harm the damage to the heart leading to heart attack etc. Some more figures, actually figures. You see that one, just a diagrammatic one. These are all the myocytes, the cells, the cardiac muscle cells. Now these are all the feeble striations, the small dots indicating the feeble striations. The blue lines indicating the intercalated disc. And once again that is another diagram showing just the striations and intercalated disc. And also the branch. Now this is the branch. The branch between the adjacent muscle cells. And here also you can see the branches. The branches. So these are all the branches. The branch from one muscle fiber is connected to the branch of adjacent muscle fiber so that there is a bridge is formed between the muscle cells. And this is the gap, this yellow region is nothing but the gap and that is being filled with the loose connective tissue. That is being filled with loose connective tissue. Now here is a comparison between the three different types of muscles. I am just representing from a tabular column. We have the striped muscle fiber, the smooth muscle fiber and cardiac muscle fiber. And as per the location where are they found, the first one you see that one normally the first one is attached to the bones, the second one the visceral muscle is found in the visceral organs and the cardiac muscle is found only in the cardiac region of the heart. The nature of the cell is not here in single, actually the cells are arranged in singly, they are long and cylindrical. Here also cells are arranged in single, long, but they are all spindle shape. Here cylindrical, that one is spindle shape. But here the cells actually show a chain. A chain of cells normally join end to end. And all the cells are short but short. Actually all the cells are normally short and cylindrical with the truncated ends. The ends are being branched, bifurcated. Then about the number of nuclei. In the case of the striped muscle, we have only one nucleus in a nucleic condition, then smooth muscle also in a nucleic condition. Sorry. In the case of striped muscle, we have many nuclei because you have many nuclei present towards the peripheral region. But in smooth and cardiac muscles, only just a single nucleus. So we can say in a nucleic condition. Now in the muscle fibers, we have myofibers. I mentioned just in the sarcoplasm, we have minute filaments. About 1 to 3 microns in diameter are formed, they are called the myofibrils. They are made up of two types of thin, two types of filaments, not thin, two types of filaments. According to the name of the protein they possess, they are named actin filaments and then myosin filaments. The actin filaments are very thin and myosin filaments are very thin. And as per the arrangement of these two, there is also variation. Now the actin and myosin filaments are regularly arranged. Well, you have in the case of striped muscle fiber and also in the case of cardiac muscle. So in both cardiac muscle as well as striped muscle, the actin and myosin filaments, what we can see the filaments are the proteins that are regularly arranged. Whereas in the case of smooth muscle fiber, these filaments, actin and myosin filaments made up the proteins, actin and myosin are not regularly arranged. If they are regularly arranged, then only we can have somehow the dot and light bands giving the striped appearance. So, the striations are due to the regular arrangement of this actin and then that is myosin filaments. And about the nature of what? The striped muscles normally contract quickly and also attaining fatigue quickly. Then if you are taking just the smooth muscle, they are contracting very slowly, attaining fatigue very slowly. But in the case of cardiac muscle fiber, you know that one, there is a rhythmicity in the case of heart muscle, they are contracting and relaxing just continuously without attaining fatigue throughout the lifespan. Suppose if they are stopping their contraction and relaxation, you know what will happen, the death of the individual occurs because the heart is functioning, the heart is not functioning, so cessation of the heart occurs. So anyway, here the fatigue, so the muscle which gets normally, uh, which never gets fatigue, that is nothing but the cardiac muscle. Then, what is the type of 
nervous control. So normally the striped muscles are innervated or under the control of the central nervous system like brain and spinal cord. And so also, actually, for example, they are volunteered in nature. Because they are all innervated with the central nervous system like brain and spinal cord, so they are volunteered in nature. Whereas the smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, they are not working under the control of the nervous system. They are working under the control of an autonomous nervous system. So they are innervated by actually autonomic nervous system, both the smooth and cardiac muscles. That is why both are called involuntary muscles. They are not working under our will. So if they are working under our will means they are working under the control of the central nervous system. But yeah, they are not working under the control of the central nervous system. They are working only under the control of a, a specific independent nervous system, what we call this one, the autonomous nervous system. Then, what about the fibers? Whether they are branched or unbranched? See that one, excepting the cardiac muscle, other two muscles are unbranched. Both the skeletal muscles and the smooth muscles are unbranched. Whereas the cardiac muscles are branched. So these are some of the actual the morphological as well as the functional differences between the three different types of muscle fibers. How are they working? What is the nature of their structure? Where are they found? That is maybe the location. Now the last type of tissue, what we have the nervous tissue. So we need coordination of the various organs, the various tissues, what we studied. For example, the epithelial tissue, they need a coordination. Then we need a coordination of the blood tissue, we need a coordination of the muscle tissue. And all these systems are integrated together to perform a specific function because of a coordination coming from the nervous tissue. So it is called as a coordinating tissue because of our activities, the animal's activities are coordinated or integrated or synchronized by means of this tissue. That is why it is called as a coordinating tissue. So, in general, if you are analyzing the anatomy of this tissue, it is being formed of two components. One is the nerve cell, the functional structure of the unit of the nervous system, what we call this one, the neurons. It is a structural and functional units of the nervous system. That is nothing but the nerve cell. The another one, the binding substance. Nearly more than one half of the volume of the nervous tissue is formed of this one, what we call this one, neuroglia. So, the brain is very large, know that one, and there are cubic millimeters about actually being about uh, 1400 uh, just grams, and about actually the size 1500 cubic millimeter, sorry, 1500 cubic centimeter, that is a volume of the brain. Such a huge volume of brain in human is not found of only the nerve cell alone, it is being bound by means of another type of connectivity, what we call this one, the neuro. Yeah. It is nothing but a binding tissue. So it forms more than one half of the volume, more than one half of the volume of the total nervous tissue or neural tissue. So we have only this neuron support, it is carried with one billion neurons in the brain and lobe. Okay. Now, the neurons. First one. So the fully developed neurons are highly specialized cells. They are not having the cell that most important cell, the one which is not having the power of cell division. Even if muscle cells somehow at least power of regeneration, least power of actual division is taking place. But in the case of nerve cells, whatever number of neurons we form, say an example of 1 billion neuron at birth, the same number of cells, the nerve cells are formed in the human body while the person is attaining even 60 or 70 ages. So the same number of actually neurons, there is no change, that means the cell is not undergoing division. That is why we have the same number of neurons from what we have at times of birth. So that is the one. This is because of the loss of capacity of the cell division. So now that is not highly specialized cell for conduction of the impulses, and also one of the organs responsible for the cell division being lost, being absent, named the centio. As a result of the absence of cell division, the one responsible for initiating the division cell division in the case of human body, they also have lost the power of cell division. So, highly specialized cells, no centrium, have lost the power of cell division. Now we can have the classification of the nerve cells based on certain criteria. This one, the first one, types of neurons based on function. 
types of neuron based on function. So there are three different types of neurons based on function. One type of neuron, what is called sensory neuron, which carries information from the sens sensory organ, or also called as receptor. The sensory organ is also called receptor. So the first now or neuron is called as a sensory neuron. It carries information from the receptor to the brain. The movement is the impulses movement is always from the receptor to central nervous system. What do you mean by a receptor? The one who receives the stimulus from the external environment. I is a receptor, a photoreceptor, which receives the light stimulus. Ear is a receptor, a phonoreceptor, which receives the sound. And from where actually the stimuli in the form of impulses are being carried away to the central nervous system, and that is brought about by the sensory neurons also called as afferent neurons, moving towards. So, number one type, the sensory neurons or afferent neurons which carry impulses from the receptor or from the sense organs to the central nervous system. The second one is a motor neuron. The second one is a motor neuron. Here the information from the central nervous system, either from the brain or spinal cord, is being carried away to the effector or to the effector by this motor neuron. The first one from the receptor to the central nervous system, namely the bright and spinal cord. The second one, the information is normally carried away from the central nervous system to the effector organ, an organ, the one which does the function. For example, muscle is an example for effector organ, gland is an example for effector organ. They are being stimulated by the information carried by this motor neuron from the central nervous system. So they conduct the impulses from the central nervous system to the effectors. Now within the brain and spinal cord, there are some neurons are formed. They are called as interneurons or association neurons or relay neurons or intermediary neurons. Interneurons or association neurons or relay neurons or intermediary neurons. Normally, Inside the brain, once the information is carried by the sensory neuron, now the sensory neuron, it is connected. This is sensory neuron. Then we are taking the brain. This is brain region. I am taking this brain. There it forms a connection with another neuron. And this neuron is once again connected to what is called the effector, sorry, what is called the efferent neuron. Now this is sensory neuron, this is a motor neuron or efferent neuron. Now, in between which in the brain and spinal cord, the message has been relayed or conveyed from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron by means of a mediate. That mediated neuron is called what is known as interneuron. So, in the brain and spinal cord, we have association neurons or intermediate neurons or relay neurons responsible for conveying the message or connecting the message that is uh, conducting the message from sensory to motor neurons, such neurons are called intermediary neurons and interneurons or relay neurons or association neurons. So these are the three types of neurons, one classification based on the functional aspects. There is also another classification based on the presence and absence of number of axons and dendrons. If you take any nerve cell, actually a nerve cell consists of, generally speaking, we will see later about the structure, mainly two components or three components. One is a cell and the cell has some branches. The number of branches may be one or two or many. If you take a nerve cell for example, like this, this is a nerve cell, having only one branch. This is what is called the axon. And this is what we call as the axon. This is the axon. So based on the presence or absence of number of axons and other branches, in some cases we have little branches, small branches may also arise from the surface of the site. So here it represents one cell body, one long branch, and branch one more or less, and small branch actually structures. And based on the number of such structures we can have. Now this long and branched one is called as an axon. This one is called axon. 
The branch structures, small branch structures are called the dendrites. The small branch structures are called dendrites. Small branch structures are called dendrites. So based on the number of dendrites and axons only, we can have the classification of the following types, the three types. Number one, just unipolar neurons. This is uh, common, it is normally seen in the case of developing in the embryonic cells, developing cells, it is seen in the case of embryonic cells, also found in the eye. So we can receive the information either during daytime or night time. For that we need some photoreceptor cells found in the retina. And these photoreceptor cells are called rods and cones. Rods and cones found in the retina of the eye, they are concerned with the perception of light, either during, that is, night time or during daytime. So in such structures and also in developing cells or in the case of embryo, we have a neuron having only one axon, only one axon. Axon alone present, there are no dendrites. So cytop and one axon, such a type is called unipolar neurons. It's not common. It's seen only in the developing embryos and also in the layer of retina, one layer, what we call this one, rods and cones layer, there also we have the rods and cones are also examples for any polar neurons. Then, the second one, bipolar neurons, the name itself implies it has one axon and one dendron. One axon and one dendron. So, cyton, one axon, one dendron, that is called bipolar neuron. And actually, in another layer, so in the layer of uh, retina, we have many layers. The retina layer of the eye has a number of layers. So one such layer has a bipolar neuron. So in the retina of the eye, we have bipolar. And the most common type, the multipolar neuron, it has one axon and many dendrites. C is the most common type. It is found in the case of developed nervous tissue. So based on the number, you have any polar, only axon. Bipolar, one axon, one dendron, and multipolar, we have one axon and many dendrons. It is found in the case of all the adult structures. Now, here is a picture, what I have present in the diagram. This is an example for multipolar neuron. You, know. you can see one axon and many dendrons. This is a site. So, this is an example for multipolar. And bipolar neuron, you know, there is one axon and then one dendron. One axon, one dendron. The dendron may be branched, that is different. So now only one axon and only one dendron, it is again branched. And in the case of unipolar, this is the cell. So you have only one uh, branch alone, that is nothing but the axon. There is no bifurcation of axon and dendron. You have only axon alone, that is called unipolar neurons. Now the types of multipolar neurons. So actually, if you are taking the structure of the multipolar neuron, so normally we can have again another classification. So one based on the presence and absence of number of axons and dendrons, and also based on the functions. Now the third type of classification based on the presence and absence of one fatty layer. We will discuss later in the structure. So, some neurons have a fatty layer, what we call this one, myelin sheath. And those neurons having this myelin sheath together call as myelinated neurons. And some neurons without the fatty layer, what we call this one, unmyelinated neurons. The fatty layer is called myelin sheath or medullary sheath. So, Neurons with the fat layer, we will discuss in detail later. Neurons with the fat layer, what we call this one, the medullary sheath or myelinated sheath. And here these are all the neurons without medullary sheath or fat layer. They are called unmyelinated neurons. Now what is the difference between these two? The name itself implies the first difference. So normally in the case of myelinated neurons, there is no fat layer. So normally it is a series of actually coverings found around the axon. So with the seed is a myelin sheet, the fatty sheet, and without myelin sheet. That is why it's normally white in color, this is green color, because of the absence. And there are some constrictions formed between, uh, that is, uh, what we have the myelin sheet. And such constrictions are called nodes of ranvier, and the nodes of ranvier are absent. You will see just in the, just in the diagram and the discussion later. 
So nodes of randomly are present, they are nothing but the constrictions present at regular intervals between the successive layers of the fatty sheet. Then, so now we know that from the conduction of the impulses. So in the case of now self, the impulses are being conducted in the form of electrical impulses. But at the junction of one now self with another now self, the now impulses cannot be conducted in the form of electrical impulses. It is being conducted only in the form of some chemicals. You will see that one. So the contact between one now cell with another now cell is called synapse. At the synapse, normally the impulses are conducted not in the form of electrical impulses but in the form of chemical impulses. And those chemicals that are responsible for transmitting the impulses from one nerve cell to another nerve cell are called as neurotransmitter. Or called as neurotransmitter. The nature of the neurotransmitter substance is different in these two types of actual neurons. In the case of myelinated neurons, the neurotransmitted substance at the synapse is nothing but actual acetylcholine. That is why these nerve cells are called cholinergic neurons. Cholinergic neurons. But in the case of unmyelinated neurons, the neurotransmitter is nothing but actually a sympathy. Sympathy. That sympathy is similar to what is called the adrenaline hormone secreted by. Sec adrenaline hormone secreted by just adrenal gland. That is why these neurons are called adrenergic neurons. Cholinergic neurons, adrenergic neurons. So I mentioned already they are white in color, that is why they are found in the white matter of the central nervous system. They occur in the grey matter of the system. So here it is found, so if you are taking the brain and spinal cord, there are two regions. One is white matter, another one the grey matter. The myelinated neurons are found in the white matter of the brain and spinal cord. And this one is found in the grey matter of brain and spinal cord. Now the acetylcholine released at the neurotransmitter is being normally broken by means of a substance what is called acetylcholine esterase and here the name of the substance responsible for the destruction of the neurotransmitter sympathy is nothing but monomide oxidase simply called as MAO. So the impulses in the case of myelinated neurons are conducted very fast because of the presence of what we call this one road nodes of Ranvia. The impulses are being conducted in the form of jumping structures. So it is not being conducted in the form of the streaming movements but may means of what is called the jumping movements, what we call this one, the saltatory conduction. But here the impulses are not conducted like this, the conduction of impulses is very slow. So these are some of the actual the differences between the two types of neurons based on their structural similarities and functional similarities and also some sort of differences, structural differences and functional differences. Okay, so these are all some of the things. Let's conclude with this one because of one that time. I will proceed further about just other structures regarding the structure of multipolar neuron in the next class.